Chapter thirty three of Stories of Old Greece and Rome by Emily Kip Baker. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter thirty three The Apple of Discord. Jupiter, father of the gods, once fell in love with the beautiful sea nymph Thetis of the Silver Feet, the daughter of Nereus and Doris. Before he arranged for the marriage, the ruler of Olympus first consulted the fates, to see whether any misfortune was likely to attend his nuptials, and the three sisters, who spin the thread of life, night and day, declared that Thetis was destined to be the mother of a son, who would be far greater than his father. Although Jupiter could not imagine how any god could supplant him in Olympus, he was nevertheless unwilling to act in defiance of what the fates decreed, so he gave Thetis in marriage to Peleus, king of Phythia, who had long loved her and sought her hand in vain. The sea-nymph was not very well pleased at having to accept a mere mortal as a husband, even though he was a king, after having been wooed by the greatest of the gods. To induce her to consent to the marriage, Jupiter promised that he and the other gods would come down from high Olympus to attend the wedding, and the prospect of this great honour soothed the pride of Thetis so that she consented to marry Peleus. The preparations for the wedding were begun in the coral caves of her father Nereus, and all the ocean deities and sea-nymphs helped to beautify the palace under the sea. When the wedding day arrived, Jupiter, with all the attending gods, came to grace the marriage feast. The guests took their seats at the well-filled table, and pledged the bride in brimming cups of wine. There was nothing to mar the joy of the occasion, until suddenly an uninvited guest appeared in the banquet hall, and the laughter died away into an ominous silence. This unexpected visitor was Eris, or Discordia, the goddess of discord, who had not been asked to the wedding because her hideous face, snaky hair, and vicious temper made Thetis fear that her presence would anger the other guests. The strife-breeding goddess regarded this omission as an insult, so she went unbidden to the marriage feast, determined to vent her wrath and spite on those who had received the coveted honour. For a moment she stood looking at the assembled company, with glances full of hatred, and she laughed mockingly when she saw them shrink away as she breathed over them her poisonous breath. Then she threw on the table a golden apple, and immediately vanished. The guests were eager to see the beautiful fruit, and as they passed it about among themselves, they were surprised to find engraved on its smooth surface the words, For the fairest. Immediately there arose a lively discussion as to whom the apple should rightfully belong, and each of the goddesses present was inclined to believe that the fruit was intended for her. At last all the contestants for the golden apple withdrew their claims except Juno, Minerva, and Venus, each of whom disputed hotly for its possession. Juno contended that her power and majesty gave her the best right to the prize. Minerva claimed that the beauty of wisdom surpassed all other charms, while laughter-loving Venus asked who could rightfully be called the fairest, if not the goddess of beauty. As the dispute grew more and more bitter, the goddesses called upon the other guests to decide their respective claims, but no one was willing to assume this responsibility. Since the apple could be given to but one of the three, the other two would be sure to vent their anger and disappointment on those who made the decision, each believing that the judges willfully refused to admit her superior charms. So at the suggestion of one of the company the entire wedding party adjourned to Mount Ida, where the beautiful shepherd Paris was tending his flocks. Jupiter appointed him to be the judge of the contest. The bewildered shepherd took some moments to recover from the surprise of having this brilliant company break in upon his solitude, and he stood watching them in awe and reverence, not daring to speak in the presence of the immortals. Paris was not, however, an uncouth peasant lad, for, although occupying the lowly position of shepherd, he was really the son of Priam and Hecuba, king and queen of Troy. When he was a mere infant, he was left on the mountain to perish, because an oracle had foretold that he would cause the death of his family, and the destruction of his native city. But though so inhumanly exposed to cold and the hunger of wild beasts, the child did not die, for he was found by a shepherd, who adopted him, and brought him up to follow his own calling. When Paris grew to manhood, he was so handsome that the wood-nymphs, who were his companions, 
all sighed for love of him. Among them was the fair and gentle Aenone, whom Paris secretly married, and with whom he lived happily on Mount Ida. Though his foster-father had told him the story of his birth, Paris had no longing for the glitter and grandeur of palaces, for he felt sure that King Priam would wish to kill him if he learned that the son he feared and hated was alive. Paris had grown so accustomed to the solitude of the mountain, that when the wedding-party suddenly came upon him, he stood fearful and silent, while Jupiter, showing him the golden apple with its inscription, bade him judge which of the three goddesses should receive it. Before he could make any answer, Juno told him if he gave the apple to her, he would thereby win great wealth and honour. Minerva promised him the gift of wisdom far exceeding that of mortal men, but laughter-loving Venus whispered in his ear that if he awarded her the apple, he should have the most beautiful woman in the world for his wife. Whether it was the alluring beauty of Venus that blinded his judgment, or the reward which she offered that tempted him, it is impossible to tell. Perhaps it was for both of these reasons that Paris turned quickly, and placed the coveted apple in Venus's hand. This decision brought upon him the wrath of both the discredited goddesses, who began from that moment to cherish a hatred for the house of Troy, and to plot its destruction. Venus told Paris that in order for her to fulfil her promise, he must now go down to the city of Troy, and make himself known to his parents. She assured him that he need have no fear of his father, for she herself would so order his affairs that the king would welcome him and acknowledge him as his son. Later on she would arrange that he should be furnished with ships in which to sail to Greece, for to this country he must inevitably go, since Helen, wife of Menelaus, king of Sparta, was the most beautiful woman in the world. Obeying carefully all the instructions of the goddess, who had now become his protectress, Paris left his shepherding and went down to the court of his father King Priam. He was so blinded by the vision of his glorious future that he did not think how heartless he was to desert the loving and faithful Enone, who mourned for him until the hills echoed with the sound of her cries. To tell the story of Paris's return to his native city, of his voyage to Sparta, and of his abduction of Helen, would be to tell the story of the Trojan War and of how dearly Paris and his household paid for the most beautiful woman in the world. When the sons of Priam were falling one by one, beneath the fierce blows of the Greeks, Paris was wounded by a poisoned arrow, shot by Philoctetes, who had received these famous weapons from Hercules when he lit that hero's funeral pyre. As the poison entered Paris's veins, and he knew that he had received a mortal wound, he sent at once for Enone who had always loved him so dearly that he believed she must have forgiven his treachery and desertion. He knew how skilled the nymph was in the use of healing herbs, and she had once told him, in the happy days of their love on Mount Ida, that if ever he were wounded, he should send for her and she would heal him. Paris therefore dispatched a messenger in all haste to bring his wife from her home among the hills. But Aenone refused to accompany the messenger for she knew that it was not for love of her that her husband desired her presence. So Paris died of his poisoned wound, and when Enone heard of his death, she went down to the city and saw the funeral pyre with its flames leaping towards the sky. Filled with remorse at her refusal to come to his aid, Enone could not look on at the sight of Paris's burning body and live, so she sprang upon the blazing pyre and perished beside her lover. End of chapter 33